All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome back. We are in Genesis 26. Uh, Isaac and Abimelech. Looks like we'll be going through the whole chapter. All right. At Ezi, Derail, Jeff, Sakaya, who would like to read? And do something different today. Ezzy. All right, you can read and I'm going to jump in and I might stop you just so I can, you know how I like to do. I like to kind of take in a little bit of what we're reading if we have to. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Ezzy. Jeff said he can read next. All right, cool. We'll start with Ezzy. Go ahead. And there was a scarcity of food in the land besides the first scarcity of food, which was in the days of Abraham. And Yitzhak went to Abimelech, sovereign of the Philistines, in Gerar. Yep, that's the Philistines to Gerar. Okay. And because, uh, you know, I'm reading from Holy Scripture, so yep, correct yep. me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Jehua appeared to him and said, do not go down to Mitzrayim. Live in the land which I command you. Sojourn in this land, and I shall be with you and bless you, for I give all these lands to you and your seed. And I shall establish the oath, the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I shall increase your seed like the stars of the heavens, and I shall give all these lands to your seed. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. Yep, let's talk about that. <clears throat> let's talk about that. That's very important. So, first of all, they're traveling south. They're going down to, you know, to Mitzrayim or Egypt. No, he said don't forget. Where is it? That part down. Go down. I saw it. I heard it. It says go not down to Egypt. Don't go down to Egypt. Oh, okay. Thank you. I heard down. I, did, I missed the part. I wasn't looking. Don't go down into Egypt. Okay. Well, one thing I heard was Egypt is down, okay? Just a geographic location from Israel, from the promised land. All right, Egypt would be south, okay? That's just an interesting uh, fact. Um, obviously, the, the covenant between Abraham is passed on. Abraham, Isaac, right? The, the covenant blessing that through the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's being passed on down. And nonetheless, last but not least, um, and we talked about this a lot of times, uh, a lot of times that prophecy, the seed, is talking about Yahusha, the Messiah. So through the Yahusha, the Messiah, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All nations, that includes Israel, the nation of Israel, and Gentiles will be blessed. How are they going to be blessed? It's not just by what some groups think being judged and cussed and, you know, the judgments and the, no, these families are, that's, that's a curse. That's not a blessing. The blessing is salvation, eternal life, redemption, that, you know, these, these families, these nations of the earth will have a king, uh, you know, who will redeem them and who will establish righteousness on the earth. So what is right? The last one I like, verse 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice, okay? In your offspring, verse 4, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? And the answer is because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my requirements, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Anybody want to touch on this before I do? No. Jeff. Go ahead. Obviously, obviously, we're pre Sinai here. Is that what you're going to touch on? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Why don't you give me your taste of it, your flavor, your, your side, your version? Uh, well, I mean, I, I believe Yahuwah always had ways he wanted his people to be, but when they yep. got especially troublesome, he had to write them down in black and white and, and get it in their face. Mm -hmm. But he's always had those ways. It just wasn't until Sinai that he put them down on, you know to say, no more confusion, guys. This is what I want. I don't want you to be confused. This is it. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's how he did it, because it was for the troubled, the, the sinners. It's when they got out of hand. 
you know? So that's I've, what I think. I've, I've talked about this before and I want you guys to learn this. Um, there's a lot of laws that are in the law of Moses that wasn't a law before Sinai, okay? And we we talked a lot about this. One of them is um, uh, like marrying your 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 sister, right? According to the law of Moses, that's no longer permissible. But before that, so far we've been reading a lot of instances where people are marrying their sisters and procreating with their um, with their siblings. Okay, so. What does that say? That says that not everything that was in the law of Moses existed before the law of Moses. So we gotta be careful when we're trying to teach people that the law always existed, okay? There is a distinction between the law at Sinai and the law that existed from Adam, okay? There is a distinction. We don't have a lot of information on what the specific laws were, right? It wasn't communicated line by line. But we do see some things from Adam to Moses. We see that there are unclean animals and there are clean animals. There is distinction being made, right? Uh, we see um, uh, Cain and Abel giving offerings, right? Mm -hmm. We see altars being built by Noah and Abraham. They built altars and they, you know, they sacrificed animals. So these things existed before the law of Moses, you know, but just be careful that we don't, try to say the whole package existed beforehand because it's not necessarily, that's not necessarily 100% factual. Um, however, the truth is that the laws that did exist, the laws that and commandments that God did give to Abraham, he obeyed that. Now, that doesn't mean that he obeyed it 100% perfectly because we saw many instances where he actually had a little doubt, right? When it came to, you know, uh, blessing him and, and uh, blessing his children, you know, Sarah doubted. She's, she's losing patience about being able to give birth with her, her original husband. And so she decides to allow Abraham to have a child through Hagar, right? But it's like, yeah, who was like, that wasn't, that's not my plan for you. I, I want you to have a child by Abraham through you, Sarah, you know? so. Then Yahuwah gives them that gift. Um, but nonetheless, Abraham obeyed. And what does that say? We talk about this a lot, faith, faith and works. Faith without works is dead, right? The book of James or the book of Yaakov says that faith without works is dead. You can't really say you have faith and you don't obey. You don't put your belief into practice. Um, some Christians would say that the works that are described in James is about doing good deeds to other humans, but that's not the only works that matters to Yahuwah. The first works that matter to Yahuwah is obeying his commandments and doing what he wants. Second is to love your neighbor as yourself. The first commandment is to love Yahuwah with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your strength is a physical thing. That's a physical thing, and it requires us to walk out obedience to God's commandments. So um, we talk about it a lot in our fellowship. We are not a works-based salvation group. We don't believe that you're saved by works alone. That is ridiculous because there's not enough works that we can do to earn our salvation. Um, and, uh, you know, we can't boast in ourselves. It's first in what Yahuwah has done. It's his mercy. It's his grace. It's his compassion uh, that allows us to be saved. So. You know, the fact that Yahusha died on the cross for us was not of our doing. Nothing we did has anything to do with that. I was completely out of our control, out of our hands. That's called grace and mercy. All right. However, once we accept that gift, we have to put it into practice and we have to actually walk it out. So Abraham believed God early on in Genesis when Yahuwah said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Your children are going to be like the stars. And the heavens and the sand of the sea. <clears throat> it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness or in other words, righteousness was put into his account simply because Abraham believed. Before Abraham even did any works, he believed with his mind and his heart. He's like, all right, God, I believe what you're telling me right now. And because of that belief, 
righteousness was put into his spiritual bank account. So he's made righteous by faith first. And that's the principle, that is the scriptural principle from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's always been about faith first. Faith has to be preeminent, uh, consistent, persistent throughout our walk. However, walks, I mean works, obedience, physical, tangible manifestation of obedience, hands, feet, eyes, mouth, has to manifest obedience coupled with faith. And I believe that's perfectly what James talks about. Faith without works is dead. And your faith is actually perfected by works. So your, your faith is good, right? When you don't have any works to back it up because you're a baby, you're young in the faith, you don't know a lot of stuff. We haven't read all of scripture. So there's a lot that we need to learn. However, once you couple obedience with that faith, now your faith is perfected. What that tells me, what James is saying, is that faith isn't perfected yet when you're first a believer. <laughs> that means that there's a level of faith that is, is distinct. There's, there's different levels. There's, there's lesser and greater faith. And I believe that by works, your faith is, is made greater, has greater value and greater uh, effect. Ezzy, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to um, point out that um, I guess I have a question. Um, if this was the first time that Yahuwah was speaking to Isaac, is this the first time? I'm, I can't be, I, I gotta be honest. I'm not sure. Um, I want to say yes, but I would have to, I would have to review and go back and, and check. But what if it was, do you have a point that you want to share with that? Um, just that I think that it's interesting, the timing that he spoke. So it says in just the first few verses that there was a scarcity of food in the land. And in Ezekiel 14, starting in verse 13, uh, to, I guess I can go down to 20. Um, but I just remember reading in scripture where Yahuwah says that he brings famine or scarcity of food to the land so that man can turn back to him. Um, I don't think this is that particular verse, but it's still related. So in verse 13 of chapter 14 of Ezekiel, it says, Son of man, when a land sins against me to commit a trespass, and I shall stretch out my hand against it and cut off its supply of bread and send scarcity of food on it and cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, declares the Adon Yahuwah. If I... If I cause an evil beast to pass through the land and it shall bereave it and it shall be uh, a wasteland so that no man passes through because of the beast, even though these, these three men were in it, as I live, declares the Adon Yahuwah, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the land be a wasteland. Um, I won't read all of that, but I just think it's interesting that um, he's, he's giving a warning not to go to Mitzrayim in the midst of a famine. And just like Isaac had prayed to Yahuwah before, with this famine, it doesn't show that he actually prayed to Yahuwah. It just shows that he's going to Abimelech. He's going to another man for providing what he needs or for salvation. So I, I don't know if there's any significance to that as to why Yahuwah chose that moment to speak to him, but I just wanted to point that out and ask that question. I'm not sure. Has he, man, you be getting some... Some stuff. I don't know how to answer these things. You got something, Milo? I'll, I'll ask the question again. Were you saying that um, Abraham went just like to a man because he went to Bimlech? Or just to clarify? So it says Isaac. It says, um, and there was a scarcity of food in the land besides the first scarcity of food, which was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, sovereign of the Philistines in Gerar. Yeah, now we know that the Philistines were in, in Canaan. Right, we all agree that mm -hmm. yes. and Yahuwah says, "Don't go to Egypt. Live in the land I tell you. Sojourn in this land." Um, so that I believe that is in Canaan, and that that is he wasn't seeking after man, but that's literally part of the land that Yahuwah told him that he can sojourn in, and we'll start seeing later on what happens. But um, so I, I disagree with that like he was seeking salvation from a man. Plus, there was previous. Um, well, interaction can we just verify if that's the question she's asking is that the question you're asking Nezzy? 
Yeah, the, qu the question that I'm asking is, I'm wondering if this is the first time that Yahuwah has appeared to Isaac because he's going to a man you okay. know, for, for help. Got you. I yeah, it wasn't that, she, it wasn't, that, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure, Ezzy, that's a good, that's a good question. I, I guess you see that, um, I'm not sure, we would have to look at more instances, let's say, let's put it that way, right? You brought up, a, you brought up an instance in, in uh, what was that, Ezekiel? You brought, you brought up another instance where that happened, right? Uh, it almost seems like if you're a chosen of Yahuwah, and you're going the wrong way, Yahuwah intervenes and like, yo, you know, like you're going the wrong way. Let me tell you, or let me tell you what to do so you don't go by man-made instructions. Is that kind of where you're going? Like, it seems like Yahuwah comes in? Yeah, yeah, because I don't know where Abimelech is. So, I mean, is that... Is spiritually in his walk, you mean? You don't know where he's at spiritually? No, 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 I'm saying, no, physically. Oh, I don't okay. Care. Him going to Abimelech, I don't know, because he's saying not to go down to Mitzrayim. So I don't know if Abimelech is, is near Mitzrayim or if, 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 those, if those two things are even related. Him going to Abimelech and getting this warning from Yahuwah, are they, is it related because he's going to man? Or are you saying, Milo, that Abimelech is in the same land or the same area that Isaac is in? I believe, according to what we were reading, that Abraham went into Canaan. They're dwelling in Canaan. Uh, and uh, in the previous chapter, 25, we had read that uh, this is where Abraham went to get a wife for his son Isaac, and he, he got Rebecca. And so they, you know, Abraham dies, um, Sarah dies, you know, Isaac's mom, and he takes Rebecca into his, mo his, his parents' tent. And that's, so they're living in Canaan. They had their servants go back to the land where they came from, which is the land of Ur or, you know, Mesopotamia or whatever, went and got a woman from there and came back to Canaan. So they're in Canaan somewhere, and the Philistines are in Canaan as well. But Canaan at this point is huge because it's filled with all kinds of, you know, different people. You got anything else to add to that? Yeah, so it, they're not in Egypt right now. Right, they're um, not in Egypt. I believe verse 1, when it says there was a famine in the land besides the first one that was in the days of Abraham, Isaac went to been like king of Philistines to Gar. Is similar to what we were reading in Genesis 1 1, where it says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and then an account is given. So, where it's this is an account given, it's a famine. This is where Isaac ended up, or specifically was, and now it's going through the count. Yahu appeared to him, said, Don't go to Egypt, live in the land I tell you about, sojourn here. Um, and then it goes, it goes on. And also, this is not the first time we see. Um, of him like or or this the type of kingdom because Abraham also was here at the same time when there was when there was a I want to say when there was a famine as well again um yeah because it says not the first famine besides the first famine so Abraham was here in this land of Canaan as well with where Abimelech was at so yeah okay any other follow-up questions as he on that no we're good thanks all right Good question. Intricate thoughts. I didn't even, uh, I didn't even think about asking that question. That's good. I like it. All right. Verse six. Um, Ezzy, continue. Or if you want to pass it on to Jeff, feel free to do so. I can keep going. All right. Um, and Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and when the men of the place... There's, there's our answer of where he w actually was. Yeah. <laughs> right. Gerar, a specific location. Go ahead. And when the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, she is my sister, for he was afraid to say she is my wife, lest the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she is good looking. Didn't Abraham do a similar thing? Yeah. <laughs> like father, like son, I guess. Yeah, so I'm wondering now, maybe it's just the setting, like, like uh, Milo was saying, it's just, it's just, you know, setting the context or, you know, of where, where they are in the moment. Here's what, I um, see. Here's what I see, and I was trying to get to this before. Uh, Abraham is considered righteous, right, by his faith, right, and obedience. But it doesn't mean he was a perfect man. He was scared. He had fear, right? You would think that... Uh, Strong man of Yahuwah fears not, never fears, right? 
I mean, that's the goal. We should never be afraid because we have Yahuwah on our side. But here's the beauty of Yahuwah's compassion and love for us despite our weakness, you know, that he still loves us as his children. I just wanted to bring that up. Go ahead. Uh, for he was afraid to say she is my wife, lest the men of the place... Uh, should kill me for Rebecca because she is good looking. And it came to be when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, sovereign of the Philistines, of the Philistines, uh, looked through a window and he watched and saw Isaac playing with Rebecca, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, See, truly she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said, lest I die on account of her. All right, just real quick, just a, a little, a little, a little thing. Um, a different translation here I have in the web for verse uh, 8. Uh, Bimelech was looking out the window and saw that Isaac was caressing Rebecca. So actually treating her as a wife. You know what? This is not a small thing, by the way. Boyfriend and girlfriend relationships. Let's talk about it. Culturally, this has somehow become the norm. Even in Christianity, I don't know how this thing snuck in. But... It's become a norm where young teenagers are walking in the church, holding hands, boyfriend and girlfriend, and members, older members of the congregation say, oh, that's cute. What is that? That's not scriptural. You only caress your wife, you hold hands, and be romantic with somebody you're in covenant with. And I just want to make that point that out here. Abraham is married to, or Isaac is married to Rebecca. They are in covenant relationship. So they have the right to be caressing each other or, or being romantic towards one another. And that's an identifying factor of how you can identify if someone is married. And you see here culturally, Abimelech is able to identify. She's not just your sister, bro. Y'all being a little romantic. She's more than just your sister, okay? So boyfriend and girlfriend stuff doesn't fly. Won't work in this assembly. I hope that it doesn't work in yours. I hope that if you're practicing this in your assembly, that there is a culture change and that we actually uh, submit to the culture of scripture and actually get a little more scriptural. Become friends, brother and sister. Get some accountability. Um, get to know one another. Get to know one another around family members. Get to know one another around friends. Get to know one another around assembly. Get to know one another, you know, get some accountability, get some counseling, get to know each other, what you hate, what you like, you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, this is, I believe in arranged marriages. I think that's the Hebraic Israelite way is to have arranged marriages. It takes a community, uh, people of the same faith to come together to discuss, right? It takes parents to come together or leaders, whoever the leaders are of the, of the prospect uh, couple to get married or whatever. It's the leaders should be getting together, the brothers and sisters, those witnesses of this person's life to be able to discuss and talk, hey, you know, what do we think about this? Can this happen? Can this work? You know? And uh, I think that makes a very, very successful, uh, beautiful uh, marriage. Anyway. Just wanted to bring that out. I guess it wasn't as small as I thought initially. All right, let's continue. Jeff, take it away. All right, she's passing it on. All right, are we at verse nine? <clears throat> uh, let's see. So Abimelech, I'm going to start at verse nine. Uh, so Abimelech called Isaac and said, see, truly she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people had almost lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. And Abimelech commanded all his people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall certainly be put to death. Isaac, and Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and Yahuwah blessed him. And the man grew great and went forward until he became very great. And he came to have possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great body of servants and the Pelishites envied him. All right, pause. Let's talk about success, uh, prosperity. 
You know, okay, you want to talk about adultery? You want to bring something up first? Before? Well, just that Abimelech, you know, when he re recognized that she was his wife, mm -hmm. that she was his wife, I mean, he, he essentially made his whole command, like, nobody touch her. This 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 woman belongs to this man. So, and even though they're not, um, well, obviously, they're not, they're, they're not uh, Israelites, right? Because that hasn't even begun yet. Right, the whole Israelite um, concept's not even there yet. Yeah, but between nations, just understanding, like, you are not to take someone's wife, you're mm -hmm. not to take someone's. Uh, husband and, and this loose generation that we live in, people do that. People like being side chicks now. I mean, that's like a thing, you know, mm -hmm. or um, being affairs. And we were gonna thing. watch uh, Look Who's Talking last night. Mm -hmm. Look Who's Talking, and the movie starts off with a woman's a hoochie. Yeah, I forgot that she was. I was like, what is this? Did I miss this as a kid? Yeah. She's straight up sleeping. With her boss. With a boss who's married. I was like, I don't want to watch it. I'm done. I just messed the whole movie up for me. No. Turn it off. We start watching some cartoon movies, some animated movies. Unbelievable. That was 1989, y'all. That was a movie in 1989. The movie starts off with adultery. And it's supposed to be a family movie. Mm -hmm. I was so disgusted. Anyway. It is a family movie. It's a family destroying movie. Yeah, uh, family destroying movie. Goodness gracious. Yeah. I was like, what? But yeah, here's a nation that is not, we don't have any record that they're following the God of Abraham. We don't know that because the whole point is Abraham left Babylon or Mesopotamia, Ur, the land of Ur, where his family was, you know, um, idolaters and stuff like that. And the goal is to go into this land where eventually his generations later on down the road will possess. And later on, the Israelites destroy these people, the babies, animals, everything. So here's a nation that in the future is going to be destroyed who actually has a conscience and has some level of morality. As a matter of fact, I think even universally right now around the world, most humans will agree that adultery is wrong. And that's a good evangelism tool to use that commandment to get to the conscience of a person when preaching the gospel. I use it, you know, because most men in construction industry, they looking at everybody. They looking at all, anything that has legs and walks, they looking at it and they're just lusting after everything, you know, and they don't think it's wrong. But if you talk to them, if you can get a serious conversation with them and, and get to relate with them, like what you're doing right now is in the mind and in the heart of what you would find to be wrong if you were to do in the physical. Most men in the construction industry will kill somebody if they slept with their wives. Oh, all of a sudden now, it's wrong, but you get to look and, and commit all those crimes in your mind against your own wife. You know, that's a good evangelism tool to show a person their sin and to show them their need for a savior. You know, but here is a nation that supposedly, I don't know, again, I don't know who, what God they followed, but supposedly they're they're pagans, they're heathens, and but they have a moral they have a moral standard, and that is a good point to bring up. Number two, it's very success. the success. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be prosperous, y'all. Yes. Okay, I'm not a prosperity gospel guy. I don't like prosperity gospel and the uh, name it claim it kind of stuff. However, it is not wrong to go about in the world and learn worldly wisdom and, you know, uh, wisdom in economics and buying and selling entrepreneurship and things like that, learning trades and being really good at it and being very successful and working your way up a corporate ladder. Nothing wrong with that. However, he's not working up a corporate ladder. He's an entrepreneur. He has his own field. He has his own animals. And he is, you know, an ideal this is kind of what you, the ideal thing to be is an entrepreneur, own your own business, be your own boss. That is like the top thing, man. That's beautiful. And uh, so Isaac is doing it just like his daddy. And there's nothing wrong with that. So go out there. Just an encouragement to everybody, all the Israelites. Don't have a poverty mindset. You don't have to have a poverty mindset where, oh, I, I got to be poor. I got to be broke. I got to be low to stay humble. No, man. Take some time. Sometimes you got to put spiritual things, because some, some of us get caught up with spiritual things and we're just on watching YouTube videos and searching spiritual things so much that when we should be investing some time into our financial success, our financial life. So take some time to put aside 
This, this might sound heretical, but put the scripture aside for a little bit. Put YouTube aside for a little bit. Put your entertainment things, whatever you do, recreational activities, games, put that aside a little bit so you can actually spend some time in how to be prosperous and successful in your business or whatever it is that you're pursuing, whatever career you want. I hope you find that encouraging. But here, Isaac is being very prosperous. And he's not being prospered by sitting in his house praying all day and meditating. Okay, that's part of it. You got to do everything through prayer, right? Meditating, seeking Yahuwah on it. But you got to get out there and do it. You got to get your hands and feet got to be out there doing it. All right? Yeah, can I say something? Yes. You got to get out there and work. You got to work for it. Uh, even though it was a commandment to Adam, to, he's going to work now. So there's nothing wrong with having to get your hands dirty. Absolutely. The book of Proverbs is filled with the beauty of a hardworking man and wisdom and not being a sluggard and not being lazy and, and having a lion come and destroy you because you're sleeping all day. You know, there's all kinds of stuff in the book of Proverbs. But yeah, go out and work. Moving on, Brother Jeff. Uh, verse uh, 15, and the Pelishites had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and filled them with dirt. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac went from there and pitched his tent in the Wadi Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, for the Pelishites had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the Wadi and found a well of running water there, the herdsmen of Gerar strove with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they dug another well, and they strove over that one too. And he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not strive over it. And he called its name Rehoboth. And said, For now we will have made room for us, and we shall bear fruit in the land. And from there he went up to Beersheba, and Yahuwah appeared to him the same night and said, I am the Elohim of your father, Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you and shall barak you and increase your seed for my servant, Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called the name of Yahuwah and he pitched his tent and the servants of Isaac dug a well there. And Abimelech came to him from Gerar with, Ah, how do you say that? Ahuzeth, one of his friends and Picol, the commander of his army. All right, before, Isaac, we go, before we go any further, just real quick, a little recapping. There's, a, there's arguments going on between Isaac and these other nations regarding these wells, okay? Mm -hmm. Even though Isaac should be getting credit for this, they're fighting over it like, yo, it's ours. We want it, right? They see running water. That's money. That's a moneymaker right there. You find a running water, you dug it, yo, that's a moneymaker. That's ours. So they're fighting over it. Part of our success in being prosperous, we're going to encounter we're gonna encounter some backlash, we're gonna encounter some resistance, we're gonna encounter all that bad customers, uh, you know, other businesses doing shisty things, trying to undermine us, undercut us, you're gonna encounter all that. We gotta we gotta be able to move forward and uh, in this world despite our enemies. All right, Jeff, what you got? Anybody? Anybody? No? Let me keep going. Yeah, keep going. All right, verse 27. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing you have hated me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have clearly seen that Yahuwah is with you. And, and we said, Please, let there be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you do no evil to us, as we have not touched you, and as we have done only good toward you, and have sent you away in peace. You are now Baruch by Yahuwah. And he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. Very and interesting. Roasted. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's just, just before we keep going on. Just I wish we could have got the interaction between Isaac and these guys with the well. I think it was the, the covenant. I think that's why they feasted together as part of that covenant, making the covenant. Okay. They broke bread together after they, they made bread, the covenant. Yeah. 
It's kind of like a way to do it, right? Right, right. Uh, there's a little bloodshedding there, right? When you slaughter animals and, and uh, coming together to eat together and, and stuff like that. But I wish we could have got some details of what the interaction was between Isaac and these guys while they're fighting with him, you know? How was, how was Isaac responding, right? Was it a turn, in, turn the other cheek kind of attitude, right? Turn the other cheek, keep it moving. Yeah. He continues to be successful, and they see how, despite how much contention there is, but there wasn't, there wasn't the level of contention that led to violence, because it just says here, we haven't touched you. Okay, so they didn't they didn't fight physically, all right. Um, but you know, I just wonder what that looked like. You know, was Isaac like, listen, was he just staying focused, staying focused on his goals, being successful? And they're like, yo, this dude is very blessed by Yahuwah, you know. And uh, I just wonder what that was like. All I could do is wonder. And they rose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac let them go, and they departed from him in peace. And on the same day, it came to be that the servants of Isaac came and informed him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We've found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. And when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Yahudith. Can we, can we go back a little bit? I'm sorry. I, I wanted to stop you, but you were going too fast. Okay. Um, uh, I want to talk about this making the oath thing, verse 31. Okay. Now, we all know, we've all read at this point, a lot of us have a knowledge of Torah and scripture, right? We're told not to make any covenants with the inhabitants of the land, right? We hear this phrase, do not make covenants, do not be unequally yoked. We hear all these phrases, right? But that didn't... Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, but that didn't start until they were about to cross over into the land when they were commanded. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was like tearing their beards and rending their shirts and like trying to get them not to marry um, outside. And but that was the first time that if I, in my recollection that that happened. There's some context to that. One. There's some yeah. context to that one. Right. It's right. not a universal. It's not a universal law. It has to do with not worshiping their gods. It has to do with making covenants and not worshiping their gods, not marrying these people, not intermarrying because of the gods they worship, and them being a hindrance to you. Nothing wrong with making contracts with the world. That's what I want to talk about. It's okay to make contracts with the world. All right? If you're an entrepreneur, you're going to encounter the world a lot, <laughs> okay? Um, it's hard to economically prosper when you're not, you're totally, I don't know anybody who's 100% off grid from the beginning of their entrepreneurship. Jeff, you've studied some people that have uh, owned their own land, owned their own, even took over a city. I'm sure there was some kind of involvement that it took with the government, with the world, before they were able to be independent and successful. You have to engage with the government. You have to sign your name on paperwork. Those are, that's called an oath. That's a contract. And so it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. All right? Because uh, some people are like, oh, we're living in Babylon, Egypt. We shouldn't have no, no dealings at all with the world. Like, well, you're not going to be very successful going that way. All right, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, think about Joseph and Daniel and how they came up, you know? Yeah. Um, literally from the king of Egypt, from the king of Babylon. They were number two in the government. They yep. were all involved. Yep. They were as involved as someone can be in Babylon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Short of being yep. the king of Babylon. And uh, I, those, those two men gave me example to get out of that mind frame that they could, Yahuwah could bless them through the king of Egypt, through the king of Babylon. Right. It was okay. It was his blessing to them. Yahuwah wanted it for them, you know? Yep. Yeah, it's it's a it's a culture. It's a mind change for me. I was brought up Pentecostal and and then, you know, so a lot of that strictness, you know, even not all Pentecostals, because I don't know where this mentality came from, to tell you the truth, because there's some Pentecostals that are entrepreneurs or doctors, all kinds of stuff. So I don't know where I got this idea from of like I had my own poverty mindset for some reason in Christianity. I think it came from my hatred 
against the prosperity gospel movement. And I think from my hatred, I internally self, you know, on my own came up with this poverty mindset. Yeah, me too. Exactly the same reason. Yep. Like, yeah, it's weird. So if anybody else is struggling with that, I just want you to embrace scripture. Embrace what we're saying here about Joseph in Egypt. Embrace what we mentioned about Daniel in Babylon Nebuchad- with Nebuchadnezzar, the, the most pagan guy during that time, okay? Like, it's okay to be successful as long as you're not compromising your morality, your walk, you know, to get what you need to get. But we need to interact with the world. Ezzy. And then uh, the Roy family. So I was looking up uh, some of Abimelech's history from um, when he was dealing with Abraham. And I think it's interesting that um, he was watching Isaac, watching Isaac and, and Rebecca's interaction. Because if you look in chapter 20 of Genesis, he just kind of, you know, saw Sarah. She's beautiful. Yeah, send her to my room or whatever he said. And, and you know, immediately saw her as a as an opportunity or a single woman whereas here with Isaac um I think from that first encounter he's he's maybe learning from his previous um encounter with Abraham and I say that because in verse um uh in verse 18 of chapter 20 it says uh well I'll start in 17 in verse 17 it says and Abraham prayed to Elohim and Elohim healed Abimelech and his wife and his female servants, so they bore children, for Yahuwah had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So upon their departure, it looks like, you know, Yahuwah was able to not only uh, show who he is to Abimelech, but also heal him. So maybe that's why he's going about it a little bit different with Isaac, and it's almost like he has knowledge of Yahuwah you know, talking about we don't want, you know, this guilt on us. So maybe that's where that comes from. Um, Also in verse, in chapter 21, it talks about the oath that he made with Abraham about these wells. So I think it's interesting that his servants are still uh, fighting over it. So in verse 25, um, No, I'm actually going to start in verse 22. So in verse 22 of chapter 21, it says, It came to be at that time that Abimelech and Pico, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, Elohim is with you in all that you do. And now swear to me by Elohim not to be untrue to me, to my offspring, or to my descendants. Do to me according to the kindness that I have done to you and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of the well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this deed, neither did you inform me, nor did I hear until today. So Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham put seven O lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what are these seven O lambs which you have put by themselves? And he said, take these seven O lambs from my hand, to be my witness that I have dug this well. So he called the place Beersheba because of the two of them, because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba and Abimelech rose with Pico, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the uh, Philistines. So I just think it's interesting that in the end of chapter 26 or towards the end, Pico reemerges and, you know, they say, okay, we truly see that you is with you. Um, so I just wanted to, bring that out just a little bit of context for the story beautiful excellent As you done As you. cross-referencing <laughs> i love it excellent very nice thank you for that uh roy family can you hear me yes okay on the subject of work um first corinthians 7 verse 29 to 32 mm-hmm. what i saying brothers is that there is not much time left from now on a man with a wife should live as if he had none and those who are sad should live as if they weren't those who are happy as if they weren't and those who deal in worldly affairs as if not engrossed in them 
because they present scheme of things in the world. I'm sorry, because the present scheme of things in the world won't last much longer. What I want is for you to. Oh, we lost you. Amani. 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 Total phone experience over there. They got a phone. Oh, man. Out. All right. That was First Corinthians. What chapter was it? Chapter seven. I didn't go there. Seven. Corinthians seven. Also, Paul says to learn a trade so that you don't have need of anything. Paul says to learn to work with your hands so you won't you will want for nothing. Um. Hold on. I want to see if I can find this. Yeah, it's uh it's chapter first Corinthians seven, I think starting in twenty six. Yeah, around there. Right. It's twenty-nine to thirty-two. All right. We lost you. We lost you there. Um let's see. Yeah, 30 and 31. So verse 30, it says, And those who weep as though they didn't weep, and those who rejoice as though they didn't rejoice, and those who buy as though they didn't possess, and those who use the world as not using it to the fullest. For the mode of this world passes away. I think what he's trying to talk about is just holding on loosely to the possessions and the things of this world. Not, he's not saying don't do it at all. He's just, you know, uh, those who use the world as not using it to its fullest. So, you know, I like, I like a lot of, there's a lot of rich people that I've met who you would never have known that they were wealthy because of the way they dress is normal. They don't, they wear, <laughs> they go to like Goodwill and get like real cheap jeans and you'd be like, this dude is a freaking millionaire. Like he can get whatever he wants, but he chooses to, you know, buy very low cost sneakers, you know, like, I think that's, that's, that's humility. That's, that's humility. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. Not to say it's wrong to have nice things, but I think it's more hum, more humble to, to live that way. So I think that's kind of what Paul's touching on. And then, uh, but I desire to you to have to be free from the cares, verse 32, he who is unmarried, and he starts getting into all that. So, yeah, it's about staying close to Yahuwah, not allowing the world to over, overtake you. Um, Cedric, thank you, Amani, by the way, for that passage. It's very good. Yeah, I was just going to uh, say, because that's something that I've struggled with coming into this walk, because um, so many people seem to make it seem like you have to be poor, you can't have nothing, but aren't we told in multiple scriptures like Job 36 and 11, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Yeah. So if we keep the commandments, he says he's gonna prosper us, right? So. Yeah, yeah. They would like to, and this would be me, I used to do this. Yeah, prosper spiritually, you know, like, smash, right. you know? But that's so, actually there's actually a verse that completely destroys that concept. Does prosper mean cash though? It can be. Because cause cause Paul says, I would I would desire that you would prosper as your soul prospers. So if what prospering is there left right. besides our soul prospering? It has to be the physical prospering. We have to be he, he has to be designed for us to prosper in the physical. If he's you know what I'm saying? If you say just like your soul is prospering, what's the what's what's the flares into that? Fleshly side. Yeah, absolutely. So right. so yeah, man, uh yes, yeah, Cedric. Definitely uh mind change. It's okay, man. It's okay to do what you gotta do to be to go up to the next level in your job or whatever, and mm -hmm. and who cares what everybody else thinks. Um, I'm being called the brown nose sometimes because I'm doing certain things for my boss and people call me a brown nose. I don't care. <laughs> call me a brown nose. 
You know, I'm just trying to do some some good things. You know, I I don't have a great relationship with my boss, but if my boss asks for something that's outside of work, and I can do it, why not? He wants me to collect bottle caps. He's giving bottle caps to a friend of his who's collecting it for disabled people to purchase wheelchairs and, and equipment for them. So they collect bottle caps. Guess what I'm doing? Me and my house, we're collecting bottle caps. And when I show up to class, I got a bag of bottle caps. And my boss goes, good job, extra credit for you. He's like, look, at least somebody cares about their job. <laughs> and then people are like, you brown nose. It's easy. It's bottle caps, bro. Like, bring some bottle caps in, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyways, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, and I've also watched over the last few years as you've advanced and gotten pay raises before you were actually supposed to because of it. So yeah. you've been advancing at work. Uh, we'll edit that part out of the yeah. video. <laughs> we'll take that part out of the video. <laughs> you're just saying you're doing something right. Right. Yeah, I'm trying my best, man. You know, I'm not perfect. And uh, anyways, yeah. But it's a good topic, though. Cause, I mean, it's so a good many, topic, yeah. So many people think, like, when it says be not of the world, that anything associated with the world is that. So money, right? Right. Even you just said, listen. I'm guilty. I used to be there, y'all. Yeah. Right. As a Christian, I was like poverty mindset. Like, we can't do nothing good. Yeah. You wear gold watches. You can't put on a gold watch. Yeah. You can't. But even like Yusha, when he talks about taxes, right? Like people, oh my goodness, taxes. Tax collectors are the devil. Says, Rent to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to you who it's his. So it's mm. Yahuwah understands that we are in this world. Like not being of it doesn't mean you're not partaking in natural things. I and mean, there's some people that are like, oh, if you go, if you make money, you're you're serving another God. No, like they had shekels, they had money. You know what I'm saying? Like they did have money. They had shekels and they actually bartered and different things like they, there was different systems monetary systems and other types of systems and stuff but it's like it's where your heart is it's where your mindset is it's where it can money become your god yes especially the if you're in, of especially if you're in a certain kind of sales job certain kind <laughs> of sales because that's all they push right go get that money go get that money and even money's your god but you know what but money listen, pays the bills Money puts bread on the table, boy. No offense, but it does. But Yahuwah understands <laughs> that. And there's a difference between understanding that Yahuwah is the one that provides and this is a means of how he provides. When we pray, there's so many people, you know, I pray to get a job because I need to be able to provide for my family. And then we have a job, we're like, oh my goodness, I have money. Like, that's Yahuwah still allowing. Like, that's part of it. He understands Embrace we're in it. this world and we need things Take like it that. In. It's a difference when you go above and beyond and you're, that's all the you're sales chasing. I was involved in, they wanted us to lie. They wanted us to, you know, twist the truth and just, you know, say what the person wants to hear. And I'm like, yo, this is not right. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, the product that we were selling causes cancer. That's crazy. That's sick. Okay? That stuff to kill fire ants on the lawn, it now causes cancer. You know, but we're here, oh, it's safe. It's safe for your dogs, safe for your animals. No problem. I never saw the tests. I never saw the scientific research. I don't know by confidence that that's true. I'm just t telling you what my boss tells me. You know, so I pray for y'all that are in that kind of industry. May Yahoo show you favor. If there's not a way you can have integrity in the sales job, I recommend you look for another one. Sales is not bad. I've seen some. I've seen some good people that are able to like certain car sales. You know, like sometimes certain things sell themselves. And you just gotta be, you know. I've seen I've seen Christians that have done well in sales sales um, industries and stuff, and they do things with integrity. They don't have to lie. They don't have to be deceitful. They're very smooth. They're very customer service driven and prosperous. You know? So, anyway, moving on. We're almost done, right, Jeff? Finish us off. Yep. Uh, oh, let's see. Da -da -da. Verse thirty-four. And when Esau was 40 years old, he took his, he took his wives, Yahudith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basemith, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a bitterness of spirit to Isaac and Rebekah. That's mm -hmm. the end of 26. Getting some beef. Getting yeah. some beef going on here. Some contention. Um, I, also, I also recognize the Hittite. The, the Hittite name later, that's going to be a bad bloodline. Yes, absolutely. 
Yeah, but we're seeing the bitterness beginning, right? Right. Sometimes bitterness, we, we've been talking about this in our healing and deliverance, right? Bitterness is like, can, can cause tormenting, can ca cause you to get tormenting spirits because it causes you not to forgive your brother and, and things like that. When your brother repents, you don't forgive them because of that bitterness and then it causes tormentors to torment you. Not like, not, not, not like the tormentors that were tormenting Paul, the thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. It's bad tormentors that will bother you and you will keep going in sin and going deeper into sin. And, uh, you know, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And we can see maybe this is a, a root of bitterness that spread throughout the Hittites that eventually made it a bad name, you know, and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. That's all we got for that. Anybody got any questions, any comments before we end? Milo, go ahead. Yeah, I just remember I was talking about Esau mm -hmm. earlier about like what kind of character he is and such, and just seeing his wives, because we mentioned earlier, later on in Torah, says not to be in covenant with certain nations, right? Right. And uh, which is very specific. And just hear that Esau's married these two women and is grievous to his parents. To me, that says a lot. I think it just. I can see why you always say don't marry certain nations or don't marry certain peoples and stuff because of the things that they carry. I, and I do believe that it's very important that parents are in, um, in a, uh, how you say that? In tune, in, in up tune to date. In agreement with, with, with the marriage. Now there's a difference, right? Because some of us are, are Israelites and they don't do it because parents. of that, right? If you're believers. So that's a little bit different. That's a little hairier. But for the most part, I do believe that parents should should you know be not it shouldn't be grievous for them to say you're my daughter-in-law you're my son-in-law um yeah so mom look who i found i'm married you know what what <laughs> where you been for the last three years you gonna show up to my house like this <laughs> now i get that before i'm like oh that's messed up parents should be embracing you know no i understand i don't know who this guy is never saw him before you come to my house now saying you married all right, Jeremy and Amani. Anything else? This light over here is giving me. All right, we're gonna end the recording. Shalom, Facebook. Bye bye. Bye Zoom. <laughs>